All right. Okay, who's up? Uh-oh. Like three people are how, Who's down? This is Vegas working. Uh-oh. All right. Well, when, depending on when your flight is, the good news is there's gambling at the airport. So even if you're down, you still have the ride home to, to you know, uh, right until you get on the plane to try to catch up. Um, so, so like any good meal or, or anything like that, we've saved one of the best things for last for you guys. So think of this as catalyst dessert. Um, the, uh, we deal with a lot of internet analysts at Channel Advisor because of the data that we have. And one of the top internet analysts, his name is Mark Mahaney, and he's here to talk to you about what he sees in the world of e-commerce. So let's give a really warm welcome to Mark Mahaney. <laughs> Funny story, I woke up this morning and I was getting in the shower and turn, you know, in Vegas they have TVs everywhere. I turned on the, uh, the thing in the bathroom and there you were. So you were in the bathroom with me this morning, so. Well, that could be misinterpreted. <laughs> Okay, show of hands here. Who was at the uh, Thunder Down Under review last night? Come on. One, four, five. I don't think it's as good uh, this year as it was in prior years. I know Scott's a big fan of that. I think his, he told me his favorite was 2007. All right, let's see if there's some slides up here. I just want to go over three things today. Uh, top trends in the internet space. What I want to do is maybe give you some free stock uh, advice or free stock picks, which means that they're worthless. But I'll tell you what I think are the top three picks, uh, longs, buys in the internet space. I want to go over broad internet uh, fundamental trends, and then I want to talk about these 10 trends, uh, the 10 things that we think are happening in the internet space that uh, are useful, I think, to investors uh, and uh, to people in the, uh, the industry. And so just so I get it out, I cover about 30 stocks in the internet space. I've been covering stocks on Wall Street internet stocks since 1998. Uh, I was involved in the um, uh, first uh, eBay, uh, the eBay IPO. So I made a lot of mistakes and hopefully have learned a few lessons from those. Uh, amongst the stocks we cover now, Google, uh, Amazon, uh, eBay, Netflix, LinkedIn, Groupon, uh, and then uh, whatever social media networking company decides to go public anytime soon. Top three picks I like, just real uh, in uh, 30 seconds or less. Uh, first is uh, Google, second is Priceline, third is Amazon. Google we've been a little bit more opportunistic on, but I think about this as a name that's a simple play off of online advertising, one of the broadest names. It's dominated search advertising for the last 10 years. I think it will probably dominate search advertising for at least the next five years. And it's a play off at least two or three of the biggest themes in the internet space today. Mobile, migration of TV, ad budgets online, and cloud computing. The stock's very uh, reasonably priced too. So that's our top pick. Number two pick is Priceline, uh, which is this uh, great, uh, under-respected probably online travel uh, company, primarily that sells hotel rooms uh, internationally, reasonable valuation, extremely good management team, very conservatively run. Uh, and uh, the biggest risk there is that they just pi uh, ditched William Shatner as their pitch man. If they can overcome that, the stock will continue to work. And third pick is Amazon, and everybody knows Amazon. I just heard a great presentation, one of the breakout rooms by one of the managers, uh, I think it's John Rogers at, uh, at Amazon uh, for FBA. But I think about Amazon, really big picture. There's four trends this company uh, is, um, is involved with. First, uh, they're, the, um, they're the dominant online retailer, and they could become a dominant total retailer, not just online but offline, if you think about what percentage of all retail sales they could account for uh, over time. Secondly, they're a marketplace, so they had the ability to first be the Walmart of the Walmart. They could be the eBay of the eBay, i.e. they could be a combination of both of those two companies. Those are the two areas that they're competing in. Third, they become a products company. That Kindle e-reader is in a phenomenally good product. I own all seven versions of that over time. And uh, the Fire potentially could take a uh, significant share of the tablet market. So Amazon's also a product company. And fourth, it's an infrastructure company with this uh, Amazon Web Services that's generating over a billion in revenue. So it's not too often companies have kind of four different venues like that, four different large opportunities. Odds are they're not gonna succeed in every one, but if they get three out of four, that's pretty good. Uh, valuation actually I think is a uh, reasonable company, generates a lot of cash flow. A lot of risk near term, but that's why it's our number three stock. Uh, so those are the, that's the free uh, stock advice. Uh, you can see some of the other companies that we cover. Okay, let me talk about some trends in the internet space. Before I started on Wall Street, 
I worked at a management consulting company, and uh, one of the things that management consulting companies do is they borrow a Wall Street research, put it up on slides, really nice PowerPoint slides, and then present it to clients as their own. So I thought I would return to them the favor. Here's a uh, quote from a recent Boston Consulting Group uh, uh, study that says, uh, by 2016, there'll be three billion internet users globally, almost half the world's population. The internet economy will reach four trillion amongst the G20 economies. So you all know this intuitively, that's why you're at this conference, but it's every once in a while nice to get one of those broad uh, data points that just reminds you, yes, you are in a secular growth industry, uh, not only that, but it's an extremely large and uh, increasingly important uh, industry. Uh, we have some forecasts in here for online retail, online advertising, and online travel. They all are kind of part of the same ecosystem. So instead of talking about retail trends, which you know, let me try to hit you with something a little bit newer if I talk about online advertising trends. And if you were to look at this slide, and I would just circle one number in there, which is the number 21% in 2011. That's how fast internet advertising grew in 2011. And I wanna make a, two context points around that, uh, which is, one, that's faster growth than the company has had any year over the last four years. The last time they grew like that was pre the recession of 2008. Although the base then was half the size that it is now. So here's another evidence of the fact that you've got um, uh, secular growth for a sector that uh, people may have thought was mature. It clearly isn't if the growth rates are similar to what they were, almost similar to what they were uh, three or four years ago. And then secondly, uh, you've got a segment, online advertising, like, like retail, that's a play off of two or three major new trends. Uh, one is uh, mobile, and then there's also this uh, TV ad budgets uh, migrating uh, uh, online and maybe to some extent social, although I think that's part of that second, uh, second trend. Anyway, again, just a reminder of the industry that uh, you're, com you're competing in, you're participating in, and, uh, and that I am trying to track. Two fun slides, two or three fun slides. Um, uh, the question was who stole the last ad recovery, and the answer to that is Google. More interesting question is who's gonna steal the next retail recovery, the recovery from the 2008 recession. And I'm always struck by how small Amazon's share is of overall retail sales. For a while we've talked about Amazon for investors as kind of a double-double opportunity. The percentage of retail sales that goes online, the way we cut the data is about seven to eight percent. I think about addressable retail sales. So I exclude petroleum products, gasoline sales, food and restaurant sales, not all, food and rest, not all food sales, but a good chunk of them. And I think about seven, eight percent of retail sales are online. Uh, if you track this over a 10, 15 year period, we can kind of do that now. You can kind of do that now using basic Department of Commerce uh, data. You can see every year about a percentage of offline retail sales migrates online. It slows down during recessions because so much of online spending is discretionary and it accelerates out of recessions. So that first part of the Amazon double-double thesis has been the percentage of retail sales that goes online uh, will, likely, uh, 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 will likely double over the next, you know, give me a long period of time, five to 10 years. Amazon's share of online retail sales is actually well into the course of doubling. It's now, we recently cut this in a report, cut the numbers and put them in a report. Amazon actually accounts for close to 20% of all online retail sales if you look at it on a GMV basis. That's just in the, in the US market and some international markets. Most international markets is probably a little lower than that. Uh, but nonetheless, there's, uh, th th that won't double. They won't go to 40% of all online retail sales, but there's still some movement for that to continue to rise. Finally, before I get into the 10 big trends in the internet space, just to throw out some of these unit metrics. And this is a whole bunch of different companies out there. I just find it interesting. It's another one of those data points or thoughts that indicate just how, how much growth one can get if one executes well in a secular growth uh, market. Whether it's Groupon in terms of the active customers being able to grow them over 200%, admittedly off a small base. LinkedIn, Pandora, Priceline, Room Nights, Amazon unit shipped. Amazon's selling, uh, is growing its unit ship by over 50% year over year on a 40 billion revenue run rate. That's, that's, that's pretty unusual. Open table, Ancestry.com. Ancestry.com is a simple genealogy subscription business, but they're growing their subscriber base 20% year over year. This internet, the waters of the internet run swiftly. Okay, here are the top 10 trends in the internet space. Uh, Number one, 
the rise of all things mobile. So this is something that you all know. People have talked about mobile internet for four or five years. What I'm gonna tell you is that maybe as different as we've, we've uh, crossed the materiality threshold. I have a theorem, I've yet to patent it, patent it that says that once something becomes 10% of something else, it can impact the overall entity's growth rate. And that's why uh, we're not there yet with online retail. Online advertising will reach 10% 10 10% uh, of all online ad uh, revenue will be generated via mobile channels this year. Uh, that'll support that 20% overall growth in online advertising for a while. We're not there with online retail. We're probably mid single digit percentage of online retail sales or via mobile channels. But mathematically that will reach 10% 2013, probably latest 2014, my guess is next year. And then with a much faster growing channel, uh, you're gonna impact overall online retail growth rates. I think Scott, uh, uh, in this presentation, I think on Monday, talked about online retail growth rates being sustainably above 20% uh, for a substantial period of time. I think mobile does that for the very simple proposition that you made it easier for b consumers to purchase products, purchase services 24 by seven with devices just, just, that just get better, cheaper, faster every year. Uh, one simple kick or key investor question we ask at the bottom of this slide is, is the mobile transition gonna be uh, easier for transactions versus advertising companies? And I think it's pretty clearly it will be uh, easier. The one ch challenge with these advertising companies is that they monetize usage and that usage via a mobile device with a smaller screen isn't as currently as monetizable as it is uh, off a desktop screen. As a retailer, I, you, don't have that, uh, you don't have that challenge. So the mobile transition, I think about it, is pretty much all gravy for, uh, for online retailers. Second trend is the rise of all things social. So we, along with 30 other banks, are involved in the uh, pending IPO of uh, a large social network, so I'm not allowed to use the F word at this uh, presentation. But uh, you, know, you clearly have seen uh, that company become a very large source, this is using Comscore data, a very large source of all time spent uh, online for, uh, uh, for advertisers. This actually has one major uh, negative implication, which is this company and other display ad networks have caused massive deflation in uh, online ad rates. And as retailers and as buyers of uh, advertising, that's actually good for retailers. The prices that you pay, it may not feel like it in, uh, day in and day out, but the prices that you pay for display advertising is one example uh, have been holding or coming down over the last couple of years. Uh, and I think they will continue to do that. It makes it very hard for premium CPM companies like uh, Yahoo, for example, to charge uh, high rates, AOL to charge high rates, WebMD to charge uh, high rates. So there's something fundamentally deflationary about the rise of social networks that I don't think the, that the market, financial markets have yet uh, fully figured out. The one interesting question is, will there be good marketing channels for retailers via uh, uh, social networks, and I'll just throw out one question without an answer, uh, which is, could sponsored stories be akin to what email marketing campaigns were in the past? And if you think about the extent to which people communicate back and forth with email and how that shifted in some ways to social networks, it, it, it raises the question, intriguing question, of whether sponsored stories or other forms of uh, marketing within social media companies could replace, could enhance, could be, um, could supplement, there's a better word for it, I forget what it is, uh, 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 e email marketing. And I think I finished that whole slide without even mentioning, without even using the F word, that's a good thing. Third uh, trend in the internet space is the rise of all things local, and I think about Groupon, and I think about um, Yelp, Zillow, uh, Reach Local, a series of companies that are trying to go after uh, local commerce, uh, local ad dollars. Uh, this is a highly fragmented market, particularly from a marketing perspective, highly fragmented market uh, with uh, lots of spenders, each spending a small amount, very inefficiently served, uh, very hard to um, uh, service. And the simple example of that is uh, this company Groupon is generating about two billion in sales with about 10,000 employees. Uh, that's five times the amount of sales people, employees required to generate that revenue as other companies like Google eight years ago needed to generate two billion in sales. And per public disclosures, that F company able to generate 
currently uh, with only two to 3,000 employees. It's a very hard market to service. That doesn't mean it's not a very attractive market. Fourth trend in the internet space, less relevant to you, so I'll just tick through it real quickly, is the migration of TV video ad budgets online. There's that chart on the right side of that. Now, this is real data. I've wondered for years why, what took so long for TV viewing to decline or why hadn't it declined. But you've seen this over the last seven months, year over year decline in TV viewing uh, audiences. And part of the explanation that I've heard, it could be related to the economy as people come out and get jobs again, they've got less time to watch TV. I'm sure, that's, I'm sure there's some plausibility to that. But my guess is that when we, this is just the last eight months, a few years from now when we look at this chart going back a couple of years, it'll show the same thing. You're seeing this fundamental structural decline in uh, where people uh, spend time uh, entertaining themselves as this migration goes over to, uh, to, uh, to TV, I'm sorry, to, to uh, internet channels. Uh, fifth trend is the rise of what we call digital goods, uh, and I think about companies like Zynga, uh, social gaming goods over, uh, overseas, companies like uh, Tencent. Uh, again, less relevant to this uh, particular crowd, but uh, in terms of as one marketing tool, uh, inline or in-game ads are becoming a multi-billion dollar uh, industry in and of themselves. This is an industry with dramatic fashion risk. It's hard to make sure you've got the right game and that you'll have the next right uh, five uh, next games. Okay, the sixth trend is the rise of the cloud, and uh, uh, this is Amazon, something of a derivative play off this. There's a negative implication of the rise of cloud computing. There's a negative implication, a negative derivative of the rise of Amazon Web Services that people don't talk about, so I want to talk about it. And it's called the 19-year-old risk. And uh, what I mean by that is, uh, I uh, had a meeting recently with uh, Mark Andreessen, uh, venture capitalist, founder of uh, Netscape, who uh, uh, talked about how as a venture capitalist and trying to find new trends, he likes to hang out with 19-year-olds. Now that could get misinterpreted. I don't want you to misinterpret it. Uh, the point is you get these people coming out of high school, college, young people that are very risk tolerant, that are willing to make uh, big personal bets of their time and energies on new ideas, say a photo sharing service uh, that's completely run off of smartphones, not even uh, applicable or at, uh, yeah, applicable via uh, desktops, and try to build that out with a dozen people and scale it up to 33 million users uh, and then sell it to some large company. Uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, the ability to do that, to scale something up to 30 million users would be, is dramatically cheaper to do now because of the rise of cloud computing, because of the ability to outsource uh, your IT department to cheap solutions, Amazon, Google, IBM, there are a series of uh, uh, suppliers out there, HP's coming out with a service too. Uh, that dramatically changes the startup economics. So that means you got 19-year-old risk. That means that somebody out there could come up with an innovation that's just as good or better than yours and scale it up with tens of thousands of dollars of investments, not needing millions of dollars of investments. It creates greater competitive risk for all incumbent players, uh, you know, even for physical uh, uh, retailers, uh, people selling physical retail products online, it increases uh, risk. Uh, seventh trend is the rise of mobile payments, and I don't know whether there was a session here at the conference on uh, mobile payments, something we've been doing a lot of work on uh, uh, recently. Oh, that's right, Google was here, uh, uh, I think earlier today, uh, talking about, um, in part, uh, I think there was a, a couple of references to, to Google Wallet. Uh, there's a lot of bets being play made in this space. Our bet is that, uh, that the market right now belongs to PayPal if they, unless they really dramatically under-innovate, and they have in other areas, in other areas, but they have not in payments, that this will be their uh, market to win in the future. But anyway, this is an uh, area of major investments that we're seeing both public and private companies. Eighth trend is what I call the hardwareization of the internet. Maybe I should say hardwareification. And uh, you know, here, who would have thought three or four years ago that Google would be buying a, a, uh, a handset company, that Google would be coming out with tablets at Amazon would be coming out with the e-readers. Okay, maybe you could have predicted that, but then getting into the tablet space, in fact, if you'd foreseen that, you would have, uh, that would have been, a, you'd be pretty smart. I certainly didn't. Uh, anyway, the fact that these companies, online companies are starting to develop hardware assets is a dramatic change in the internet space. Uh, in some of these cases, I think it's very defensive uh, steps that are being taken by companies like Amazon as a major 
media retailer, you know that those products are increasingly being sold digitally. You have no choice but to somehow get into the consumer stream by developing uh, uh, hardware uh, appliances, hardware devices. Ninth trend in the space is increasing M&A momentum. And so what happens in industries as they go through growth cycles and growth starts to top out a little bit, or uh, companies become bigger and bigger and generates lots of cash that they think about using acquisitions as a way to grow their business. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, great acquisitions that you could do that would be faster for you in order to get into new businesses than if you were to try to do it organically. What I find interesting is that there's, if I add these up really quickly, there's like 203 billion of cash that's sitting around there amongst these companies, one, two, three, whatever that is, uh, 10 companies. That's a lot of cash that's sitting out there that, with very few exceptions, isn't being returned to shareholders, which it, some of it probably should be, some of it definitely should be, but is being used out there to buy uh, new growth engines or enabling technologies, whether it's a Kiva uh, or, uh, or whether it's uh, you know, a photo sharing uh, service. Uh, there's, uh, the unfortunate thing for retailers, uh, people in the online retail space, is that there aren't as many large natural acquirers in the space. That's the bad news for you. If you have any sort of marketing solution, the good news for you is that there's a larger and larger uh, number of potential acquirers with tons of cash burning holes in their pockets. So anyway, this will be a, um, uh, a, uh, a key trend. Uh, we're starting to see M&A activity pick up. It's gonna get even bigger over the next two or three years. These cash piles are large. These companies are looking for new growth opportunities. And uh, if you're a private company, this is one great opportunity for you. The other one is the IPO market, which has now come back, and it's been back for about 18 months, particularly in the l narrow space that I look at, which is the, uh, the internet. Almost all of these names, with the exception of Zipcar, are kind of online marketing uh, companies or subscription uh, companies. Uh, all in, this is about 40 billion in market cap that's been uh, generated by these uh, companies. So private companies have got two of these uh, interesting options, the M&A route, maybe as an exit or an IPO, maybe as the exit. The biggest IPOs uh, left, and then I'm gonna uh, wrap up. Uh, biggest IPOs left, uh, there's still uh, uh, Twitter, there's still uh, Hulu, not necessarily making a case as to whether these are good, they'd be good or bad IPOs, just listing them as potential uh, companies. Uh, we have not seen yet enough um, uh, innovation, new innovation in travel. I wouldn't be surprised to see something come up uh, there. Online retail, I can't imagine that all the uh, innovation comes from one or two companies. There's plenty of opportunities for new plays, new vertical plays there. And, uh, and then there's one other company that comes to mind, and I'm gonna, and I'll end with this, as, a, uh, as another uh, IPO candidate. Unfortunately, this ticker, CA is gone. Uh, it's, it's already being used by another uh, public company. So I'm trying to think, well, is there some sort of uh, e-commerce enabling company that holds uh, very thought-provoking, really effective conferences that's been around helping people figure out different areas to, uh, to uh, 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 helping people decide their marketing channels? Yeah, I think there's another one. This ticker's taking, but how about this one? Scott, i.e. Scott Wingo. So that, that I think could be the biggest, hottest IPO coming out. And with that, I'm gonna bring this up to a close. I got like eight pages of disclosures here. I'd like to go through every one of these pages, but I won't. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to go through any uh, Q&A. Maybe we'll bring Scott out to ask him about his IPO. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, I'm happy to, uh, I can also do a uh, song and dance number, but a any questions or we can call it a day and head to the tables, please. Yeah, so my, maybe I need to, I, I think Scott ran off. I don't, I'm a little surprised, but here was his, here was his chance. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting idea. I would like to know if there, you know, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> We already figured out the ticker, S-C-O-T. What's the question? The channel of... <laughs> the, the question is the... You uh, came the, just in time. The concept is the uh, channel advisor IPO, which was brought up this morning. No comment. Okay. <laughs> I'll ask Mark, what do you think about a Facebook IPO? Uh, yeah. No comment. <laughs> See, there you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. Next question. Or we're going to start, we'll start talking about the Celine Dion show. Please. Yeah. Okay, right here. 
Mark, hi, my name's Alpa Agarwal. Actually, I came out and met you because Gary Flake had connected us, so oh, hello. Right. <laughs> so, you know, my question is about Amazon. Uh, they're essentially a not-for-profit company, and, uh, you know, economics will say that in the long run, everything gets to perfect competition. Um, so what are your thoughts about, I mean, they're investing in the business, it's great for buyers, but they're a not-for-profit company, essentially. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, let's see. They're not for, for profit because they run at really thin margins, and I guess sometimes, you know, Wall Street makes plenty of mistakes. Uh, it's a crowd uh, that gets very excited about one thing and very unexcited, and it changes its mind every couple of months. Uh, so uh, it's not for profit because margins are razor thin, but it is a retailer, and uh, retailers' margins are typically razor thin. Amazon runs as a commodity business. They love being in businesses where they can beat people through you know, price selection and convenience, but lower price because they've got a bigger infrastructure and they can buy greater volume than other people. I, I don't consider them not for profit. They're going through an uh, investment cycle now that's clearly brought down margins lower than, than uh, people outside of the company thought, but you know, to its... To the market's credit, they've actually giving Amazon the benefit of the doubt, believing that they'll get through this uh, this investment cycle and margins will go back up to a normal retail mass market, uh, mass retailer margin level, which is four, five, six percent uh, operating margins. So I I think it was just a question. I think you're asking a question that very well reflects the current mood on Amazon and where we where it is in its investment cycle. But they'll, they'll come out of that investment cycle, and this investment cycle is driven by the desire to get more distribution centers out there to move eventually or very soon, perhaps, to same-day fulfillment. Uh, the, it's driven by an investment cycle into devices like the Kindle Fire, and it's driven by an investment cycle into Amazon Web Services. I think those are all good investments that the, the company is making. I think they'll generate enormous amount of cash flow, and they'll do it off of tiny little, un, tiny little margins on a very large customer base. So I, I, I believe they're actually extremely, they, they will be extremely profitable by retail standards. Hi, I wondered if there is any trend online of disintermediation wherein uh, manufacturer brands are dealing more directly than they have in the past with the end consumer. Would there be any tools that they could use to uh, do that? Uh, if it's uh, become cheaper, I, I think at the, at the end of the day, it's become cheaper for manufacturers to deal directly with consumers. I guess it comes down to what consumers want. And if the manufacturers have strong enough brand, they can do that. So uh, then I guess that raises the question of just how many brands can be strong enough to deal directly with, uh, with consumers? Well, that's one of those, uh, that's, a, that's a fundamentally a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if anybody uh, really does. I, I think there's very few manufacturers and very few brands that can have that much power that people will come directly uh, for them year in and year out. Uh, gosh, there are very few. Maybe Apple can do it, but will Apple still be able to do that multiple years from now? So my guess is that there'll always be a few, uh, they'll, they'll always, consumers will always congregate to those uh, large branded retail channels uh, and use those as a way to uh, uh, pick maybe even from the same manufacturers that they know and love, but they don't always uh, know and love them, and there's fashion risk with all manufacturers and brands. So yeah, I, I, it can happen for a few manufacturers and a few brands, but I think there's the number, I think there's a very small number of manufacturers and brands that can do that. Where's Catalyst next year? TBD. TBD, I like that place. <laughs> Uh, raise your hand if you want Catalyst in Las Vegas next year. Yeah. All right. People, the crowd seems to like it. We're going to crowdsource this whole thing. <laughs> what about Raleigh Durham? Raise your hand, Raleigh Durham. Whoa. Uh, Whoa. Are, are those your employees right there? Yep, yeah. <laughs> Actually, there's the minority of your employees. The majority of them kept their. Uh, yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Big Thank you, Scott. Thank, Thank you all. You. All right, well, this concludes Catalyst. I, I want to um, thank you guys, first of all, for coming. Thanks. We have the best customers and, and attendees in all of e-commerce, so, so thank you. I want to thank uh, all the employees. Uh, this is a huge effort that especially our marketing team puts on, but all the folks at Man Kiosk and 
um, and, and whatnot. It, it's tough because you're here in Vegas, but you have to get up the next day at 7.30 to go man your kiosk and, and run the show. So so big a round of applause to the Channel Advisor folks. Thanks for all your hard work. Uh, and then last but not least, our sponsors. Um, you know, so we're gonna, after this, we're, we're, you can still go next door and still network. We don't have a planned lunch, so you guys are kind of on your own, but this is a great time. I know a lot of folks have later flights. Um, here in Las Vegas, you don't have to give many, many hours to get to the airport. It's like literally 15 minutes away. So use this time to network. Um, be sure to stop next door to visit some more sponsors. And thanks, we'll see you again next year. Thank you.